Throughout history, the technology of war has continually changed, but the art of war, how a commander commands, has remained more or less the same. Nations have gone out of existence because of their failure to understand what war is all about, including its diplomatic, economic, and social elements. A great commander, one way or another, always seems to understand how all these forces are interrelated. On a bright October day in 1805, a few miles off Cape Trafalgar in southern Spain, the greatest naval fleets of the day finally faced one another. The British commander, Horatio Nelson, was outnumbered and outgunned. Yet he was able to secure a victory that changed world history. Admiral Nelson is without a doubt the great British national naval hero. He has had an effect on, shall we say, the country as a whole, never mind just on the fleets of his own day, which is really, truly staggering. He is, in very many ways, an unprepossessing little man. He was short in stature. He had so many bits shot off him that there wasn't much left by the time of Trafalgar to get killed. And yet, this sort of uh, domination that he had over the willpower, the thoughts, even the prayers of his countrymen is dramatic. He had the magic ability to make his men not only respect him, but actually to love him. And that uh, concept has spread to the country as a whole and remains now firmly embodied in British history. Horatio Nelson was born in 1758 in Burnham Thorpe, a small village on England's east coast. The son of the local rector, he was brought up with his seven brothers and sisters amidst the modest respectability of a church family. The young Nelson soon made it clear that he had no wish to follow his father's vocation. He wanted to go to sea. His uncle, Morris Suckling, was a famous captain in the Royal Navy, and when Nelson was 12, he persuaded his father to write to him for help. Suckling replied, What has poor Horatio done who is so weak that he should be sent to rough it out at sea? But let him come, and the first time we go into action, a cannonball may knock off his head and provide for him at once. His uncle agreed to take him on board his own ship, anchored at Chatham Docks near London. Horatio was to be one of the captain's servants. He was overjoyed. Though life afloat could be a grim experience, months, sometimes years, in a damp, dark ship, living off rotten food and soiled water. There were volunteers, but more often than not, the crews were made up of convicts or men abducted by the infamous press gangs. The Navy played the vital role in maintaining and expanding British power overseas. Throughout the 18th century, Britain was continually at war, usually with France.
France and Britain had, had been fighting on and off for hundreds of years. Uh, for many reasons, initially um, because of um, the king's rival claims. Then, by the 18th century, the European maritime nations were expanding into the world and they were fighting over trade, uh, which meant uh, uh, trade settlements abroad, and that was the start of the empires. So there was the beginnings then of the race for, for empire. And, uh, and we then naturally clashed with those maritime nations and fought them one after the other. Nelson gained experience on board warships and in the merchant navy, sailing throughout the world. His natural skills and courage, as well as his uncle's influence, accelerated his career. By the age of 20, he had already become a Royal Naval Captain. He had to keep the ship afloat and the crew aboard. Men would desert by any means they could, they could find, by uh, stealing boats sometimes, even swimming ashore occasionally, although not everyone could swim in those days. The, the captain clearly had a very big problem here, and many captains were very reluctant to let the men ever go ashore at all. The, the seamen had no absolute right to any kind of shore leave. He was only given this at the discretion of the captain. Some captains wouldn't allow any at all. Some captains were much more generous, and they realised that if they did allow some shore leave, they could build up some kind of trust with the men and, and have them come back again. In 1782, Prince William, later King William IV, met the young captain. Captain Nelson appeared to be the merest boy of a captain I ever beheld. His lank, unpowdered hair was tied in a stiff, hessian tail of an extraordinary length. There was something irresistibly pleasing in his address and conversation and an enthusiasm when speaking on professional subjects that showed he was no common being. Nelson was mostly stationed in the West Indies until, in 1787, Britain entered a period of peace. The Navy was reduced by nine-tenths, and Nelson was among those laid off. For five frustrating years, he was stranded at home in Burnham Thorpe, wondering if his career was over. War with France broke out again in 1793, and Nelson, aged 34, was recalled, this time to serve in the Mediterranean. With her Spanish allies, France continued to challenge Britain for supremacy in Western Europe. In 1797, off Cape St. Vincent, on the western tip of Portugal, the British force to which Nelson was attached unexpectedly ran into the Spanish fleet. Nelson seized the initiative, leading an assault on the enemy and managed to board not one but two of their ships. A chance encounter had led to an exploit that was celebrated all over Britain. I think every great commander must have luck. Without luck, you're nowhere. But the greatest commanders are the ones that make their own luck by careful preparation, and that is what Nelson did. He was able to create situations where he could seize the initiative. His great ability was knowing when to seize the initiative. But he paid a heavy personal price for such valour. By the end of 1797, he had lost his right arm in battle and badly damaged the sight in his right eye. The 39-year-old Nelson returned to Britain a half-blind, crippled, opium-sedated wreck. He did not expect to return to sea. A left-handed admiral will never again be considered as useful. His injuries were well cared for by his devoted wife, Fanny, and, remarkably, within a few months, he was back on board ship. In August 1798, he led an assault on the French fleet at anchor off the coast of Egypt. The capture of one or two enemy ships had previously been considered a fine success. Nelson captured ten and was dubbed the Hero of the Nile. He enjoyed the public adulation and when the Sultan of Turkey presented him with a diamond spray mounted with a clockwork rotating star, he wore it in his hat like a trophy. His officers were much amused. He looked more like a prince of the opera than a conqueror of the Nile. But his popularity was undiminished by his vanity. One admirer was Sir William Hamilton, the British ambassador to Naples, where Nelson had his Mediterranean base. 
Hamilton's wife, Emma, became his very public mistress. They toured England, um, and they got tremendous receptions in the Midlands, in Wales, uh, West Country, and um, uh, with enormous crowds, and he was a very much a, a popular hero. But when they called um, um, at Blenheim Palace, where the Duke of Marlborough uh, uh, was at the time, um, um, they, they weren't received there. They were, they were um, they, as one did in those days, they went up to the front door and the butler came out and they announced who they were. And Nelson then, being at the height of his fame, they assumed they would be um, given a splendid reception. But the butler went in to see the Duke and came out and said that if, if they liked to um, go in their carriage to a particular part of the park where there was a fine view of the lake, um, they would send out some cold food to them. A frightful snub. And Nelson was so angry that he, he just, um, he simply drove away. He wasn't going to take that. But he had another side, and that was a ruthless streak. Never better shown than in the very callous way that he treated his wife. One can make all sorts of excuses. One can point to the fact that it, it was a marriage of convenience, that it was a marriage of esteem rather than of love and lust, um, and that he had found in Emma Hamilton a woman that perfectly matched him in, in every way and inspired him. Um, but even when those allowances are made, the way that he treated poor Fanny Nelson was really very cruel. One has to take that as part of the rich tapestry that makes up the man. No one is, imper is perfectly pure and wonderful. And one of the great problems of the Victorian portrayal of Nelson was that they tried to twist this very human, flawed man into this impossible hero. One of the great things about modern scholarship is that we're learning that one doesn't have to be uh, in perfect in order to be great, um, and that great men inevitably have great weaknesses. By now, Vice Admiral, in 1801, he enhanced his reputation further with a resounding defeat of the Danish fleet at Copenhagen. The sheer determination of Nelson, I feel, is well illustrated by the case of the Battle of Copenhagen, when, as a subordinate admiral under Hyde Parker, he was engaged with the Danish fleet when his admiral hung up the signal of recall. Who had, he was too worried with Hyde Parker about the political implications of this particular operation. And, of course, Nelson clapped his telescope to his blind eye and used the immortal phrase, I see no signal, and continued to fight and indeed to win the battle. That story, I think, shows the sheer determination of the man. Despite his successes, the bitter enmity between France and Britain continued. The French emperor, Napoleon, increasingly successful on the continent, now planned to invade Britain. I think the English were very afraid of Napoleon. Classic case, um, the nurses used to use bony, as he was called, as a, uh, a means of frightening young children into being quiet or obedient. That's always a good sign, or a bad sign. Um, and certainly they took his invasion threats very seriously. So seriously, in fact, that in 1801, when the first major threat came, um, they appointed Nelson to be in command of the ships in the Channel. It's not generally known that, I think. Uh, in between all these great victories, he was actually in command in the Channel for some months of the small forces that were there on a daily basis watching Napoleon's growing invasion forces. And it was the name of Nelson, and this is why it was done, it was the name of Nelson that calmed the fears in 1801. It was mainly um, a, um, a public relations appointment because people felt safe when he was there. In fact, he didn't have much to do, and what he did, uh, the, what he did generally failed. He, he attempted a commando raid um, on, uh, on the French invasion fleet at Boulogne, and it was a disaster. But he, by that time, he was, he was so famous and so loved that it was overlooked. In 1803, Nelson was put in charge of the Mediterranean fleet. He stationed himself on board the ship Victory.
with 100 guns and a crew of over 800, captained by Thomas Hardy. It was one of the finest ships in the Navy. Nelson's task was to blockade enemy ports or destroy their ships. His main target was the French fleet at anchor at the southern French port of Toulon. For over a year and a half, he patrolled the Western Mediterranean, hoping that the French would come out and fight. But the French ships had no interest in confrontation. They were waiting for orders to sail to the English Channel to assist the invasion of Britain. Napoleon decided the moment had arrived. In January 1805, Villeneuve as ordered, set sail, avoided Nelson, and headed across the Atlantic. Nelson, distraught at his enemy's escape, set chase. As intended, Villeneuve then headed back to Europe, but the British still had too many ships guarding the English Channel, and the French admiral returned, against Napoleon's orders, to Spain. As for Nelson, he sailed back, exhausted. At Gibraltar, on his way back to Britain, he sailed into harbour for the first time in two years. He wondered if he would ever get the chance to fight and destroy his enemy. In fact, it was only a matter of weeks before that chance arrived, and the future of Europe was decided in battle. Trafalgar is undoubtedly the most famous and significant naval battle in British history. It established a superiority at sea which over the next century was to play an essential part in the expansion of the British Empire. A famous saying by a historian runs about that line of battered ships upon which the Grand Army never cast its eyes, which stood between Napoleon and the conquest of the world. A little bit, perhaps, uh, exaggerated in its sentiment, but nevertheless pointing to a basic truth. Napoleon, master of war on land, but he could never master it at sea. He could not understand the limitations which admirals face by way of tides, winds, and wrong directions, and so forth. He never fully appreciated this. On the other hand, his opponents, such as Nelson, were aware of all the subtleties of war at sea and what could be achieved thereby. The French Admiral Villeneuve had taken his fleet south to join the Spanish fleet at Cadiz. It was this combined Franco-Spanish force that Nelson was determined to annihilate. After a short break in England, Nelson, in September 1805, rejoined his ships at sea, stationed outside Cadiz. He ordered that no signals be made to announce his arrival. He did not want to scare the enemy into staying in port any longer than they intended. Then he withdrew virtually all his ships over the horizon, out of sight. Some of the 17,000 British sailors were in poor shape having been at sea for months, even years, eating preserved food and drinking stagnant water. Daily, Nelson worked in his cabin, organizing fresh supplies. We have been brought trousers for the use of the fleet under my command. But instead of their being made of good Russian duck, those sent are made of coarse wrapper stuff and the price increased. The issuing of such coarse stuff to the people will no doubt occasion murmur and discontent and may have serious consequences. The contractor who furnished this stuff ought to be hanged. Though believing himself outnumbered, he sent six of his 33 battleships to Tangier and Gibraltar to acquire rations. Healthy crews were fighting crews.
Many of the ships have scurvy in them, but onions and lemons, I hope, will eradicate that complaint. And a sight of the French at sea will cure all our complaints. Nelson um, 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 had to fight a very brave, very tough enemy. Both the French and the Spanish were um, very good fighters. Uh, both the French and the Spanish often built better ships than we did, better materials, better de design, and this was recognized at the time. The difference was that once we achieved superiority at sea, we blockaded them in their ports, and Nelson and the British fleet was at sea and getting toughened, um, um, be being um, exercised, trained, um, 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 rehearsing gun drill again and again, and while the enemy was sitting in port, um, not getting experience, unable to exercise their big guns. And so when they met at sea, we were far, our ships were far, and the ship's companies were far better trained. And uh, the, the rate of fire, of gunfire between the two was remarkable. I mean, the, um, it has been said that um, our, the British rate of fire uh, at sea was up to 10 times that of the enemy. It may not have been quite that, but it was certainly several times, several times the, the rate uh, of the French um, and Spanish ships, and that could be decisive. Nelson understood the role that technology played. A skilled commander will always take advantage of new developments. One that the British had was the flintlock trigger, which allowed for instant firing, thus greater accuracy than the slow fuses used by enemy fleets. Nelson's victories were the result of the most intensive and meticulous and careful preparation of his subordinates, uh, of his captains, and through his captains, all his crews, down to the lowliest seamen, um, before his battles. And that is the clue to understanding that Nelson, like so many great commanders, perhaps like all great commanders, understood war. He understood its chaos, its uncertainties, and he understood that, therefore, once battle was joined, it was too late for him to give detailed instructions. It was too late for him to alter the direction he had given to his captains, and that they must be clearly understanding what was required of them uh, before the battle began. I think it is quite right to say that the battle uh, actually was won before the first gun was fired. And the key to it was partly morale, but much more than that is that um, at that time and before his other battles, he had taken his captains not only into his confidence, but he had briefed them so thoroughly that once action was joined, he need give no more orders. They knew exactly what to do. Traditionally, opposing fleets lined up in parallel and fired at one another until one side was forced to surrender. Nelson, however, decided to split his fleet into two columns which were to steer directly at the enemy line. The leading French and Spanish ships would be cut off from the action and would take time to turn around. Thus, with almost a third of their ships isolated, Nelson's opponents would lose their numerical advantage. But as the ships could only fire to the sides, the risk was that while the two columns sailed directly towards the enemy, they would be totally exposed. It was a characteristically bold plan and his captains approved. When I came to explain to them the Nelson touch, it was like an electric shock. Some shed tears, all approved. It was new, it was magic, it was simple. In any fighting force, initiative is a very important quality. It's something that no fighting force can do without. Um, there has to be a trust between the senior officers and the junior officers, um, and that is quintessentially what Nelson achieved. That is the lesson above all that he taught. As a junior officer himself, he claimed the right to question if that was necessary. As a senior officer, he embodied in his whole method 
in all his plans, the idea that he would discuss his plans openly and freely with his junior officers around the dinner table on board the Victory, those famous dinner parties before every battle, that he would open his mind freely to them so that they understood him instinctively and he understood them. And then in the heat of battle, he would trust them. They knew that he trusted them to do what was right. They didn't let him down. Nelson was still hoping that the enemy would sail out of port. This time he was in luck. An angry Napoleon told Villeneuve that the invasion of Britain had been abandoned and that he was to sail immediately to the Mediterranean. By the evening of the 20th of October, all 33 French and Spanish battleships had left Cadiz and were heading south. As darkness fell, the British fleet, with all lights extinguished, were already stalking their prey. But by dawn the next day, Nelson, steering southeast to block Villeneuve's path into the Mediterranean, realized that he was too far ahead. He turned his ships around. Then, spying the enemy fleet, he turned southwards again, keeping his ships just out of sight, at a distance of only 10 miles, but in position to attack. At 10 past six, on the morning of the 21st of October, 1805, Nelson signaled to the fleet to form their two columns and sail towards the enemy. Here, at last, was the moment he had been waiting for. Villeneuve had escaped once before, but he would not escape again. No captain can do very wrong if he places his ship along that of an enemy and engages it in one-on-one -on -one combat. At 8 a.m., Villeneuve suddenly decided to turn his 33 ships back to Cadiz. The result was confusion. Just off Cape Trafalgar, they stretched out in a ragged crescent shape. But the Franco-Spanish fleet still had the advantage of six more ships and 500 more guns. The winds were so light that the fleets crawled along. It would be some hours before the first shot was fired. Nelson now devoted his time to gearing his men up for battle. With Captain Hardy, he walked through the ship, offering encouragement to all. Lord Nelson went round the decks and said, My noble lads, this will be a glorious day for England, whoever lives to see it. He made himself loved. He did that by relating to the men Un under, under his command as fellow human beings. For example, he insisted that the compensation um, um, which would be paid by the Admiralty to the families of men who were drowned at sea was exactly the same as that paid to the families of men killed in action, which hadn't been the case before. Personally, he could talk about himself with sailors as an equal after Copenhagen he went into the hospital um, at Great Yarmouth and saw a sailor who'd lost his right arm. And he joked with him, and he, pointing to his own, the stump of his own right arm, he said, well, Jack, you and I are spoiled uh, uh, fishermen. So, and, and that kind of story got around. And it was known that uh, he could joke with people, he could laugh at himself a bit. He could be very stern and ruthless too. But there was a very human element there, which there hadn't been in the other, 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 um, other heroic figures of the time. Nelson could be as harsh as any other captain, but he brought enormous confidence to his sailors. They trusted him as a commander who led rather than simply sent his men into battle. There's three ways of motivating human behaviour, as far as I can see. One is punishment. And that to my, in my book, that is not leadership at all. When people do things merely out of fear of what will happen if they don't do them. The second is reward. This is what people like Alexander use, it, they took a lot of medals and booty and so forth for those who did well. 
And the third is by modelling. You create an impression, an image, and other people like you so much, they want to act like you do. And Nelson used the last two, not the first. Nelson ordered the drums to start playing, while the men readied themselves, clearing decks, laying sand to soak up any blood, stowing furniture and animals, priming weapons. The men were variously occupied. Some were sharpening their cutlasses, others polishing their guns as though an inspection were about to take place instead of our mortal combat, whilst three or four, as if in mere bravado, were dancing. His own ship prepared, Nelson now sent a personal and unprecedented message of encouragement to the rest of the fleet. England expects that every man will do his duty. As it was relayed, great cheers spread from ship to ship. He followed it with the signal, engage the enemy more closely. He uses very rare signals in the battle as a means of putting a new edge upon his men's metal. Very simple, straightforward signals, uh, but they were psychological more than tactical in their importance. Because every sailor on that fleet knew what they, Nelson represented. He was the greatest sailor of his day. They were proud to be in his fleet. They were going to do their absolutely uttermost to fight their particular ship or their particular gun to the very uttermost and to win their individual engagements. The two columns edged towards the enemy, the victory leading one of them. Someone suggested that Nelson should transfer to a less dangerous ship behind, but he refused, replying that his position was at the front. Uh, I know of no, no case in Nelson's life when he was not brave. And I think that he was just one of, the, one of those brave men. And he was um, um, always concerned, concerned about his men, and he was going to lead, lead them from the front and set an example. And he knew they were looking to him, uh, and therefore that was a great spur to, to do that bit more. And um, he was therefore known um, as the man who, um, who um, uh, the officer who led from the front. And um, he could be seen when he was ashore. You know, there was this, this, this admiral who'd lost an arm in action. I think Nelson's courage is twofold. He had physical courage. He undoubtedly had physical courage. And not necessarily of the unthinking type, although it is well attested, well witnessed, that he became exhilarated in battle, that the adrenaline flowed, and that he, maybe a few days before, having just been thoroughly seasick, ill, would be transformed into a kind of steely fighting machine and actually almost physically enjoy the danger. So there's that part of his courage. The other most important part, which is not given to so many, is that he had moral courage. He had the courage of his own convictions. He had the courage to disobey orders when he believed he was right. He had the courage to take on vested interests in the West Indies when he believed he had the right of law behind him. Now, it's the combination of moral with physical courage which makes him special. He did things that, in a lesser mind, would have been very risky indeed. But he knew exactly when to take the risk. It wasn't a case of recklessness. There were very carefully calculated risks, but they were always successful in Nelson's case. If they'd been unsuccessful, it would have been total disaster for the British Navy. At noon, long-range firing began. At 12.15, the first shots carried towards victory. Almost immediately, Nelson's secretary, standing with him on deck, was struck down and killed. But Victory could not respond for another 15 minutes and suffered terrible damage. At 12.30, both British columns finally engaged. The 
victory sailed between Villeneuve's flagship, the Centaur, and the ship Redoutable. Everywhere, as individual ships attacked the nearest enemy they could find, cannon shot ripped into sails, wood, and flesh. In naval warfare, there was nowhere to hide from the carnage. We were engaging on both sides. Every gun was going off. A man should witness a battle in a three-decker from the middle deck for it beggars all description. It bewilders the senses of sight and hearing. There was the fire from above, besides the fire from the deck I was upon. The guns recoiling with violence, reports louder than thunder, the decks heaving and the sides straining. I fancied myself in the infernal regions where every man appeared a devil. The cries of the wounded rang through all parts of the ship. Two of the boys stationed on the quarterdeck were killed. A man who saw one of them killed afterwards told me that his powder caught fire and burned the flesh almost off his face. Our men kept cheering with all their might. I cheered with them, though I confess I scarcely knew for what. The brave boatswain was fastening a stopper on a backstay when his head was smashed to pieces by a cannonball. At 12.50, the victory was so close to the French ship Redoutable that their sails were interlocked. In the confusion of battle, Nelson stood out clearly from the men on the deck, having insisted on wearing his distinctive uniform. He was an obvious target for the French sharpshooters. The captain of the French battleship was one of the few to have used his time in Cadiz wisely. His snipers were now highly trained. The swell of the sea and the British defense hampered their efforts. But at 1.15, a musket ball hit Nelson in the shoulder, passing through a lung and lodging in his spine. He was rushed below as the French prepared to board the victory. At that moment, another British ship, the Temeraire, crashed into the Redoutab and unleashed a volley of shot which killed most of the French marines and sailors poised to leap onto the victory's deck. The battle was now a series of duels that raged on between individual ships. Of the original 33 enemy ships, 23 were either captured or destroyed. By evening, the British had suffered 449 fatalities but four and a half thousand Spanish and Frenchmen had been killed and 20,000 taken prisoner. Among them was Villeneuve. Despite the scale of the success, few in the British fleet felt like celebrating. Nelson, aged 47, had died at 4.30 that afternoon. It confirmed England absolutely as the leading sea power of the world, fastened her eyes on the distant horizons rather than on Europe, and so in many ways was responsible for that long period of empire that followed, where Britain really almost abandoned Europe um, and looked to its empire beyond the seas. Trafalgar had been a remarkable victory, but back in Britain, the relief and joy at having beaten the French and Spanish was overshadowed by deep public mourning for Nelson. In January, he was given a hero's funeral and entombed in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. His death, at the moment of his greatest triumph, secured his place as a national hero. And every year on the 21st of October, on British ships and naval bases throughout the world, 
a ceremony is held in honor of Nelson's immortal memory. The fact, I think, too, of dying for his country at the moment of victory has a particular appeal to it, certainly for the English in any case, and that is another big factor in the fact reasons why his appeal comes down. But perhaps the most important of them all is this way in which he could control, he could inspire, he could above all lead very disparate kinds of people and make them all feel proud to be members of a team which was headed by Nelson. I find Nelson a remarkably modern man. I can even, uh, I can even imagine him on a, on a television talk show. He, he left so much of himself behind in marvellous letters, which were kept because he was famous in his own lifetime and they were kept as uh, souvenirs of his life. Uh, he was somebody we, could, we can all identify with in some way. He was Superman and everyman. He was a hero with human weaknesses. Uh, and that even though very, none of us really can identify with the extraordinary um, actions of his, um, we can identify anyway with some of his weaknesses. He was, um, I think he was uh, our first real national hero, our first pop figure, if you like. Uh, before Nelson, uh, the, the, the admirals and, and um, what were thought of as great national heroes, were unknown to the mass of the people, but Nelson was known to them uh, through, um, um, not only through the news of the day, but, but, but caricatures, which often laughed at him, but in an uh, affectionate way. So he uh, was um, a, a real um, pop idol, if you like, of his time. I think there are really three qualities that make for good commanders. The first is the ability to plan, plan in detail, plan to such an extent that every eventuality is taken care of. The problem with that type, if that's all the qualities you have, is that you turn into somebody rather fussy, rather like the First World War generals. Then there's a kind of commander that has that instinctive grasp, that charisma, that flair, such as Lawrence of Arabia. The problem with that kind of commander is that they're very erratic. And then there's the third and very rare type of commander, which I would call the great commander, which is who is able to combine both those. And that's precisely the key, in my opinion, to Nelson's quality. He had the ability to plan to the utmost degree. He was able to talk to his captains and prepare for every eventuality so that whatever situation the fleet was found in, they knew exactly what to do. That is detailed planning but he also had that charisma, that initiative, and also that moral courage that enabled him in the heat of battle to tear up plans and go hell for leather for the opportunity that offered itself. It's a very rare combination, but Nelson certainly had it. By destroying enemy fleets, he secured for Britain a century of naval domination that allowed its empire to expand throughout the world. Idolized in his lifetime for his personality and his achievements, he is still remembered 200 years after his death as a great commander.